Hi, my name is Blaine Hansen, and I'm here to talk to you about how software can literally be perfect. A surprising thing to claim, but as I will show in this talk, something that is much more true than people think it is. So we will talk about formal verification. We're going to ask the questions, basically, what is that? How is it useful? Um, what are the core ideas that underpin it and make it possible? Then we'll talk about the Magmide project, which is something I've been working on, a very, very early project, with the goals of making formal verification and provably correct software practical and widespread. And just to call this out before the talk begins, it will be much easier to understand this talk if you are a software engineer, if you have programmed before, especially if you understand type systems, especially the type system of the Rust programming language. But Probably you can still get something out of it regardless. Let's see. Okay, so this is a point I won't try to spend too much time on because I think it's pretty actually obvious to most people. But software is really broken. They, here's just a couple of ways that software causes real harm in our society, either depriving people of, of life, causing actual pain or destruction or destroying property or just slowing things down and, and causing security breaches, all those kinds of things. And to give a little more rigor to this claim, basically I found these two reports. So one by the Consortium for Information and Software Quality, um, titled The Cost of Poor Software Quality in the US, a 2020 report. And they were stating larger numbers in this report, but these two subset numbers interested me. They, they seemed particularly relevant. One that there is, in 2020 alone in the US, they estimated about $1.56 trillion in kind of lost productivity or other kinds of damage because of operational failures in software. And a separate $1.31 trillion in technical debt. And not technical debt in software systems generally. Software, you know, technical debt is, is all over the place. But this is technical debt in critical software systems, systems that underpin some sort of important societal function that, that has to be paid down, not would be nice to pay down. And then this McAfee report, the hidden costs of cybercrime. Their estimate for 2020 was that worldwide, just shy of a trillion dollars of, of literal monetary loss was incurred because of cybercrime in 2020. And then additionally, kind of $145 billion in global spending on cybersecurity, money that could have been spent elsewhere. And that, that um, uh, almost a trillion dollars was up from only about a half a trillion dollars in 2018. So it, it increased a lot in those two years. 2020, it makes sense why it happened in that year because of the global pandemic and everyone, lots of industries shifting to more remote styles of collaboration. But, you know, that will only continue as, as our society continues to become more digital. So yeah, software is really broken. People in who work with software know this. This is really obvious, but it should be obvious to everyone that software is important. It underpins critical social infrastructure, things like our nuclear arsenal and our banking system and lots of different kinds of medical devices and aircraft. There's so many things that have software in them as a core part of their design and that probably couldn't exist in the form they exist today without software. And when that software and lots of different kinds of software bra breaks, it hurts people and it slows down human progress. So this is important, it matters a lot. And essentially the claim of this talk and of um, a long running f academic discipline, a formal verification says, this isn't necessary, this doesn't have to be this way. And I guess the, the core idea, the reason why, the, re the main reason that this is true is that software is literally nothing more than just information. It's information that, that represents logical ideas and that information, we happen to be able to build computers and the structure of those computers and the circuits inside them means we can feed this information into it and the computer will use that to do information or to do work processing this information, but software is just information. And yeah, it relies on those hardware assumptions, but the software itself, this information artifact that we create can literally be perfect. It can be mathematically perfect in the exact same way that we're able to prove mathematically that one plus one equals two. It is possible to prove that a piece of software is correct, that it matches some specification. So yeah, that's what formal verification is all about. It's about using the tools of formal logic of mathematical proof to 
verify things with basically absolute certainty about pieces of software. So I first got, um, I got started down this path of being interested in this field when I encountered this Quantum Magazine article, um, Hacker Proof Code Confirmed. And essentially, it just describes some work by a DARPA-funded team. DARPA is the defense, basically, it's, it's a defense agency that funds scientific research by the United States. And they basically had a military quadcopter that they tasked this team of professors and academics to design control software for this quadcopter that was provably secure. And then after the team of academics had done so, they gave a red team of world-class hackers and security researchers the types of people who, you know, you find in the news taking over Jeeps with Bluetooth or demonstrating that's possible or demonstrating it's possible to tell an ATM to give you as much money as you want, etc. People who usually have just are able to demonstrate complete control over software systems they should not be able to demonstrate complete control over. But again, this quadcopter software, there was a logical proof. It was a mathematical proof that it was secure. And sure enough, the red team, no matter how world class they were, no matter how usually they're able to get into anything they want, um, they um, were not able to get anywhere. Basically, the red team made zero progress. They were completely unable to even escape the partition. They were given access to a part of the quadcopter even, and they were not even too able to get out of that, the, the, the portion they had been given, and were not able to hijack the, the quadcopter or make any meaningful progress at all. And in a way, that's not surprising. It was good to check. It was good to make sure. But again, the, the team of researchers had a mathematical proof. They had logical certainty that this was true. And I revealed this point a second ago on accident. But the only problem is that these tools that these people built, right, they were purpose-built. So they're fairly narrow for the kind of work that this, this team is doing fairly. And it was built by and for academics. And I don't know, anyone who's ever worked with academic tools can maybe say that's not what everyone would necessarily prefer to do. So this is where Magmite comes in. Or I guess just following on to this, this is the dream of Magmite. The dream of Magmite is to bring these ideas of formal verification out of the ivory tower, out of academia, and to everyone. In a real way, we're going to talk more about this later, but in a real way, a lot of these ideas are kind of sitting and just collecting, collecting dust. Most of the research is not being applied in any meaningful or interesting or, or societally useful way. And so Magmide wants to basically make a proof language that can be used to verify real programs and real programs for any, any architecture or environment. And it wants to do so with a you know, verified bare metal system. We'll get more into what all that means in a while. So, when I talk about this, people often have a certain amount of skepticism as, you know, it, even, even if these academics were able to pull this thing off, how is this possible? How does this make any sense? And so that's what a big chunk of this talk is going to be about. It's going to be kind of describing the core ideas that make formal verification possible and therefore helping you understand why this is possible and making it more salient, that it really is very, very doable. So these are the core concepts. The core concepts are dependent types. The idea that type checking and proof checking are kind of secretly the same thing. And then something called separation logic. Let's get into it. So dependent types, I guess the central idea is that they're more powerful than normal types. And to kind of clarify why, let's look at an example in this little Rust function called is1. So this is a lame function. It just takes um, a variable n as input, which is an unsigned 64-bit integer. And it returns a Boolean. And the body of the function just checks that this n is equal to 1. Not very interesting. And here is the type of this function. Right? We take in the u64, and we transform it. Right? This arrow type, or this arrow is the function type in type theory. Transform it into a Boolean. Pretty simple. However, that type we just saw, let's look at it again. This type is very, it doesn't give us a lot of information. All we know is that we pass in some u64 and we get out some boolean. We don't know what these mean. We don't know if they have a relationship to each other. We don't know anything about them. So we can see this very clearly with these functions that all have the exact same type signature but have completely different behaviors. 
So, you know, one of them checks if the thing is, is zero rather than one, one of them returns true in all situations, one returns false in all situations, and of course, many other functions. There's probably an infinite number of functions that return something similar to this. So, that's the problem here is that, you know, this example I'm giving is pretty small. It's pretty lame. I'm gonna use that word again. And in this situation, testing is probably good enough. We could just run inputs through these things and that's fine. But that only works for functions where the inputs and the outputs are both relatively finite. And they're finite enough that we can tractably run a lot of inputs through them. Something like a string, even though obviously we can only fit a string that fits on our machine, but a string is in principle infinite. And so if you have a, a function that takes in strings or even, you know, even worse, combinations of strings or combinations of strings and other very large types, then testing, we can only really hope to get kind of some coverage of this idea. And we can never really be sure that this function, um, that a function we write, right, is truly correct. So real guarantees come in things like type system, where they don't come through, through testing alone. And that's where dependent types come in. So normal types can only reference other types. You know, in, in languages like Rust, we have things like generic types that can take as basically a parameter other types, and then a new type is created from that. But a dependent type system essentially allows types to reference values, concrete specific values, not just types. So let's look at an example of this. So this function is written in a language called coq, C-O-Q, and there are kind of a lot of usability problems with this language, and we'll talk more about maybe why this isn't practical for everyone to use, but this is a definition of a function. It's the is one function we were looking at earlier, basically. And the thing is, its type guarantees that it is correct. So here is the actual type, if we read it off. Um, I'll, I'll read it off for you. So basically the type of this function is that for all, for any, for any particular n, which is a natural number, and this natural number type in Coke is slightly different than unsigned number numbers. It's, it's infinite and um, it's modeled differently. It's not modeled as bits, so, but it's like an unsigned integer. Anyway, so, but for, any, for, a, for any particular n, we return this big thing. And basically this is read as um, we return a b, which is a Boolean, such that b is true if and only if n is equal to one. So this is the critical part. We're looking here at the type of this function and the return type of this function is dependently typed. Basically it has within it a reference to the variable n. It points back at the specific n that we passed into this function. And basically instead of just a Boolean, some Boolean, we're being given a Boolean that is constrained, that is only allowed to be true in the exact situation where the n that gets passed to this function is equal to one. That's really, really cool. <laughs> That's something that, you know, it's, this is maybe not a good way to do this. I, I'm, I'm kind of stretching this example a little bit to show you what's possible. And so maybe we wouldn't actually write this function because it's, again, so small and we, there's so much weight, there's so much syntactic weight to say this, this thing. But again, we can get a guarantee from the type system that this is true. And just to explain some of this other stuff, this isn't a Coke lesson, so I'm not trying to deeply explain this, this example. But basically, I'm defining the function here right, with this match statement. And then this part here, this line, is me giving Coke something called interactive tactics. That's what this simple LIA stands for simplify and then perform linear arithmetic. So basically, I'm telling Coke how to figure out that what I'm doing is correct. So yeah, Coke makes this a little painful, and I, maybe I, this is not a very good example, but that's, it's possible. And there's something about that that's amazing, where this relatively simple idea of being able to reference values and types gives us a, kind of a new power. So th that leads to, there are other ideas that make languages like Coke powerful, but dependent types is the core one. And it basically means that in practice, type checking and proof checking are the same thing they're equivalent to one another. So if, for example, I made a mistake in this function, right, where I'm matching on zero instead of one, like I'm supposed to, so now the type and the function body don't align, then 
the type system will be able to catch that this is not correct, right? Statically, without having to run the function. I don't have to run a test to see that this is a problem. And basically, the, the tactic that I gave, that simple Leah thing, that tactic will, will do what it does. It will kind of look around for you know, proofs or it will try to figure out that what I'm doing is correct. And it won't be able to because zero is not equal to one. And in order to get the type system, coax the type system to pass off on this function and say it's okay, I'd have to be able to provide a proof that zero and one are equal, which is obviously impossible. So again, that's cool. The type system checks this for me statically before the code is even run. Um, and secretly, this is kind of true for all languages with type systems. All type systems kind of represent a logic. I'm not going to get hung up about this too much, but all type systems represent kind of a logical system. And all type checkers are basically finding proofs that, you know, the propositions implied by a program are all consistent with one another. Let's not get too hung up on that, but, you know, as a, as a tease for some bigger ideas in this world. So let's do a little slightly more interesting example because that is one function, probably not a very good function to write, kind of clunky, and pretty small. <coughs> so in contrast, this thing, what I'm doing here is I'm defining a new type. Um, the Coke uses the word inductive to define new types. Um, and it's a type called even. And essentially, what's going on here is that even is kind of like a type that takes a function. It's kind of like a generic type but it's generic on values rather than types. And so even can take any particular natural number and it kind of gives us back a logical proposition. And again, not a Coke lesson. There's, there's details here that I'm skimming, skimming by, but to give you, just all to give you an idea. But essentially, this function, or this type, excuse me, is like an enum in Rust, where you know, it has two possible constructors that both of them can be used to construct a value of type even. And these two constructors line up with a system for basically proving or asserting that numbers are even. So the even zero constructor, it's type, right? This is a piece of data, this constructor, this, this function, if you want to call it that. It's a function that takes no arguments, but yeah, even zero is a piece of data, a constructor, and its type is basically that even is zero. So, that's, you know what I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's data that has a type that is a proof. And then this other, this other constructor, even plus two, its type is one of these function types we were just seeing, where, you know, for all n, for any particular n, so I can, I can take this constructor, this even plus two, I can pass it any n, any n, was a nat, which is a natural number, and then also a proof that that number is even, and hint, you know, I can maybe start with this one, but I can pass the, the fact that even is, or that this particular n is even, and then I'll get back a proof that that number plus two is even. That's what these s's mean. We'll talk about that a little bit, but mostly it doesn't matter for now. That's basically plus two in Coke. So that's pretty cool. We have a system that lines up with the definition of even numbers. So yeah, just to kind of show a little bit more example, Coke is not a C-like language. Um, it's a Lisp-like language. So if you wanted to call a function called foo with a and b, you do it like this instead of you know, the way we're used to it in most languages. And so yeah, that ss is, the s stands for like successor. It's the next function. So it's basically you know, n, n plus one um, twice. So this is what's this, this really cool, is that now we can produce pieces, we can create pieces of data whose types are basically proofs. So the idea is that you know I'm going to I'm going to create some piece of data called four is even, and its type is that four is even, and then if I'm able to find a piece of data, if I'm able to construct everything and put all this, these things together in a way that is consistent in the type checks, then I've basically proven that four is even. The existence of the piece of data is a proof of this of this idea that the that the type kind of um, encodes. So here I'm doing it kind of clunkily. This is not the way we typically do it in Coke. You know, I'm, I'm doing exactly what I kind of hinted at, is I'm taking even zero at the bottom, and I'm using that as a proof that zero is even, and passing that to even plus two. And that gives me a proof that two is even, and then I can take that, and I can pass that as a proof that two is even, and then do that to two, and then pass it again to even plus two, and that, at the end, I end up with a proof that four is even. Okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's still pretty small, but it's, it's cool. Um, then, 
this is maybe the way, way we really do this in Coke, is they have what's called that interactive tactic system. I kind of alluded to that with the is1 function before. But instead of constructing this thing manually, because that could get pretty tedious, I instead kind of use a, basically a metaprogramming system to tell Coke, hey, use this tactic to figure out a piece of data, how to construct a piece of data that has this type. And that's what this happens to do here. Okay, so where it gets really cool is where we start doing things that are, again, a little, little more interesting. So say we have this recursive function called double, and that's what fixed point means in Coke. It's a, it's a recursive function. And it takes an n, which is a natural number, and you know, it does an algorithm that will basically double this number. It will, it will have the effect of multiplying by two. You know, this algorithm that does that. But then, so we're now again creating a piece of data. The type of this piece of data, though, is a function type. So even double has the type that for all n, right, I can pass in any n. For any n, I can take that n and I can transform it into a proof that that number doubled is even. And then, you know, here's an interactive tactic telling Coke, again, how to construct this. This is a, a, a function type. And so the thing underneath the hood here is going to be a function. I'm going to build a function that does this. And then Coke will be able to type check that function to make sure that it actually does this, that it's actually able to construct one of these even things all the time. And so f basically, once Coke type checks this function and said, oh yes, this actually does do this. I can take any n and then give a dependent type that that number doubled is even. Then what I've done is I've proven with absolute infinite certainty that this is true. And it's true for the infinite range of these natural numbers. That's really cool. So yeah, even double is a proof transforming function. And I guess this is where this gets really interesting is that even double is like a unit test in a way, because in a way we're kind of running numbers through this thing, but it's literally infinitely better than a unit test because it is able to guarantee this for me for the infinite set of numbers. Rather than having to you know, grab a bunch of numbers, put them through this function, test them, or having to ge randomly generate numbers, that's a better way of doing unit testing. But again, all we can do is get kind of a collection of numbers we are able to check, this is able to guarantee it in the type system statically without running the function once. So yeah, infinitely better than a unit test. And something that's kind of nice here is that is one, we kind of had to mangle the return type of that function, and sometimes we want to do that, and maybe it'd be nicer to have a language like one of the things Magmite will do. Maybe it would be nicer to, if that was less bulky to describe that, that is one type we had before. But here we didn't have to change the definition of double. We can prove this thing about double from afar. And this, this proof, this, this piece of proof transforming, or this, this proof transforming function is something we can reuse in other places. So yeah, I mean, this is really, really powerful. This is an idea that's extremely exciting. And if you want to learn more, then here are two resources that I liked and I thought were good. Um, they're still kind of academic. They're not perfect, but I was able to get through them. So software foundations is pretty good, and then certified programming with different types. And of course, it's a whole discipline. There's a lot of stuff to, to learn, a lot of things to find. So yeah, these languages are really powerful. And here are some you know, projects that are doing cool stuff, using Coke specifically, or some of them use other tools. And you know, Feit-Thompson theorem is, is a, a mathematical theorem, so you can do this to, do, to just do normal mathematics, and that's cool. And these other three things are all software verification projects, verifying low-level important pieces of software. Um, that high assurance, high assurance cyber military systems is what we talked about in that quadcopter article, actually. So this is my follow-up question. This is the question I have as I learned about all this is, <coughs> why isn't this coming? Why aren't even, even advanced programmers, people who are building really complicated systems, things that really need to be right and robust, why aren't they doing this? Why isn't this more widely known? The first most obvious answer to that question is the research debt. We'll talk about what that is in a second. And I think the real problem is what I'm calling the pure functional dogma. And we'll also talk about that. So let's go through them one by one. So research, research debt. I cannot take credit for this idea. This is an awesome term coined by Chris Ola and Sean Carter in a blog post that I'm linking to here. And the 
blog post is so good, I'm just going to read some quotes from it. So there's a trade-off between the energy put into explaining an idea and the energy needed to understand it. On one extreme, the explainer can painstakingly craft a beautiful explanation, leading their audience to understanding without even realizing it could have been difficult. On the other extreme, the explainer can do the absolute minimum and abandon their audience to struggle. This energy is called interpretive labor. I'm quoting this out of order. So in this, these next quotes are talking about climbing the mountain of mathematics. People expect the climb to be hard. It reflects the tremendous progress and cumulative effort that's gone into mathematics. The climb is seen as an intellectual pilgrimage, the labor or rite of passage. But the climb could be massively easier. It's entirely possible to build palaces, paths and staircases into these mountains. The climb isn't something you're proud of. The climb isn't progress. The climb is a mountain of debt. The insidious thing about research debt is that it's normal. Everyone takes it for granted and doesn't realize that things could be different. So yeah, that's part of the problem. A lot of the tools I've been referring to are designed very obtusely and with kind of bad academic language and they're not shared with enough people or they're really punishing to use. And there's a reason for this, is that academia has bad incentives to properly explain and expose their work. It makes sense structurally. An academic, their success is based on writing papers that are well-reviewed, that are cited, and that gain them prestige with their peers. Their peers being other researchers at all, who are also at the cutting edge of their extremely narrow research discipline. So rather than having to kind of tell many people about what they're doing and, and create work that can be reused by anyone happening to come by and discover it, they are only incentivized to produce explanations that someone who already understands all of this can, can quickly understand. They assume shared knowledge. So yeah, an academic can win prestigious prizes, they can get tenure, they can be cited, they can be prestigious in their field without anyone else in the world having any clue what they're talking about. And even if all of their papers are extremely punishing and do no effort at all to make the ideas that they've discovered understandable. They, again, leave people to struggle. And this is a huge shame and a huge waste of human potential because there's a really good leverage. If, if an explanation, if a good explanation is written down and created, that one explanation can be reused millions or billions of times by, by other people. And so we save all of that effort of millions and billions or millions of many, many people with only one person having to do what Chris Ola and Sean Carter call distillation research which is taking these ideas and finding the ways to really make them make sense in the human mind. But as much as research debt is a problem, it is not, I think, the real problem. And <clears throat> the real problem is this. It is that academics and the work they do is way too dogmatic about the pure functional paradigm. So to describe what the pure functional paradigm is in case that doesn't mean anything, so basically, in languages like Haskell and Lisp and ML and Elm as a front-end language that's pure and functional, essentially in these languages, they just outlaw the idea of mutation or side effects. So all data is immutable, and if you want to perform a computation from a piece of data, you don't mutate the data, you just kind of take pieces of it and copy it to make new data. <laughs> and in a way, there's something about that that's useful. The, in certain domains, it kind of can give a programming language and the programs you write in it kind of a mathematical purity. It has the same cleanliness as pure logic, which is the reason why this, this all kind of happened. Or pure logic is what inspired this, this paradigm. And it means that programs are less likely to have confusing kind of mutation dependencies or webs of things that are hard to understand or hard to reason about. So this is useful in a lot of places. But... It's always fictional. Regardless of how useful it is in some kind of abstract domains, it's never true. It's always a lie. And that's because computers are just big chunks of mutable state. All computation at the lowest level, inescapably, is mutation. You know, a, a processor is just mutating the values that are, are in its processor registers, mutating the values that are in memory, and that's it. That's all computation is all the way down to the, the, the base of it. So the pure functional paradigm can only ever be kind of a model, a fiction that's used as an abstraction on top of what computation really is. So especially for systems that are really low level, things that have to interact at that lowest level, 
that are kind of dealing right with the, the bare metal, or they have to be really performant, or even that just are more practical. You know, a lot of people don't use Elm, a lot of people use JavaScript still, because sometimes you just need to mutate a thing, and that's the simplest thing. It's sometimes not that helpful to twist your algorithm or what you're doing into some weird shape so that it fits into the pure functional paradigm. So yeah, for a lot of people, especially people at the lowest levels, this paradigm is a non-starter, and for a lot of other people, it's just not actually that practical, it's not that helpful. So we need systems to reason about real computation. The tricky part, though, <coughs> is that things like Coke, this language that I've been talking about in these previous examples, it actually does make sense for that to be pure and functional because it's literally just type theory. It's logical type theory. You know, it's a branch of logic that is powerful enough to create mathematics and to model all the things that humans are capable of modeling. And that type theory is pure because it has, it, 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 it is just pure logic. So that's the tricky part is that those things make sense to be pure and functional. But we can't take that paradigm and just drop it into the real software we write. So that's where separation logic comes in. It is a logical framework for reasoning about mutable state. We'll talk about more what it is in a moment. But you can take a pure logic like Coke and you can define separation, lo separation logic inside it and use it to reason about the kind of programs that you can model. And I'm actually a little surprised oftentimes how it seems like even people who should know about separation logic don't. So it's a very powerful thing. But to understand why it's cool, <coughs> we kind of have to understand what it's reacting to and the limitations of normal logical frame or systems. So this here is P and Q. That's what that little wedge is. It's the and operator in formal logic. So P and Q could just be logical assertions. It could be, I have three cookies and it is raining. And so if both of those things are true, then P and Q, the conjunction of the two, is true. And in a normal logic, it's perfectly reasonable and equivalent to take any of these assertions we have in AND and just duplicate it, right? P and Q is equivalent to P and Q and P. So, okay, that makes sense. It's maybe not terribly useful, but it makes sense. And for pure eternal facts, things like four is even and one plus one equals two, then yeah, that's fine. I mean, duplicating things like that, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. That's, that's reasonable. <clears throat> but what about mutable facts? Things that could change. So the fact that four is even will never change. It will be true forever, eternally. But this assertion, something we'd read as memory location A points to one, that can change in a single instruction. That's not eternal. It is only true at certain points in a program depending on what's happened before the program. So. As an example, um, this syntax where I have the, the brackets around you know, an assertion, that's kind of a thing that form of, it's a syntax form of verification often uses to talk about at this point in the program, we know this, we have these assertions we can make. And so maybe this is like Rust. Maybe A is a reference to a memory value you know, that points to one, and we can dereference it, and we didn't change it, so this assertion is still true, and we can perform a, a, a function that maybe will crash if this Boolean isn't true, and we can be confident that that's not going to crash because our assertions tell us that everything makes sense. But if we do any actions that could possibly invalidate or, or try to duplicate this knowledge, this assertion that A points to one, I mean, here in this, this example, we're passing A to a function, but we don't even necessarily have to do that for, for some function to, to mess with what, we, what we're doing. It might try to duplicate that information, or it might change it out from underneath us, or something might happen to it. And <coughs> it gets tricky to say, oh, you know, normal logic doesn't stop us fast enough from doing that. Because we can just duplicate assertions, it's really easy to create situations where we're in an inconsistent state. I say that doesn't make any sense, where A points to one and it points to two. Something that we just have to prove will never exist. And this was happening before separation logic was invented. A lot of the systems people, you know, again, the researchers trying to do formal verification, is that the AND operator is just too lenient for mutable facts. And the consequence of this is that it was really difficult to scale your reasoning about the whole program. Rather than being able to reason about one little function and put it together with other things, you kind of had to have proofs that reasoned about the whole program. Everything you brought in complicated how, or how made it much more difficult 
to prove that any part of the program is correct, because every part of the program can mess with all the other parts of the program. Separation logic fixes this by introducing this star operator. Um, the star operator is called, um, it's called the separating conjunction, and it's pronounced and separately. So in this situation, we'd say, a, you know, a points to one and separately, a points to one. And this is the critical thing, is that even though this thing we have, right, this, this one I have the next next to, a points to one and separately, a points to one, even though those two things are consistent with one another, even this is not allowed in separation logic. Basically because a and a are the same. They, they are not disjoint. They are pieces of state that are overlapping, right? The, the, these two assertions are talking about the same piece of state. So separation logic doesn't allow that. Se assertions that are put together with the separating conjunction have to be disjoint. They have to be separate, which is why it's called separation logic. Which has the consequence that we can't just duplicate an assertion like this. Um, we can do things like this. Right? Obviously, if A and B are different, then they can point to stuff and we can put them together with our separating conjunction. But we can't just duplicate assertions to talk about the same thing. <coughs> so anyone who knows Rust probably sees where this is going, where we have you know, knowledge about A and we do stuff with it. But if we want to let other people in on that, or if we want to give them that knowledge, we have to give it away to them. We can't duplicate it and keep a copy for ourselves and give them one. We have to give it away permanently. Because if we copied it, we'd produce you know, a violation of the rules of logic. And so that's where the Rust idea of ownership came from. Um, yeah, what this means is that we can verify small pieces of our programs, and it's much easier to put them together now. Because separation logic bakes into the way it works that everything has to talk about separate stuff. So if this function and this function are being called at the same time, they can't be talking about the same things by definition. We've, we've baked that into the system. And yeah, like I said, this directly inspired Rust. There's a straight line from separation logic invented in something like 2001-ish and Rust. So yeah, separation logic can be more complicated than this. Probably you can already tell that this is a little, a little too strict. You know, Rust has, has, you can have multiple read-only references. And in this situation, the kind of simple way I've described it, you couldn't. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff I'm, gl I'm, gl I'm glossing over. And you can have more complicated versions of separation logic. <coughs> and that's exactly what the Rust bar checker does. It basically represents what's called a decidable subset of a fractional separation logic. We don't have to go into all that. But this decidable subset part is important. What it means is that the borrow checker is kind of like a proof finder. It isn't actually because of the way Rust is implemented, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a function that because of the way it works, if it basically says yes to your program and your program is all safe Rust, then it can always say, yep, looks good. And that's because the, the chunk of this separation logic that, that Rust has implemented is decidable, meaning we can have an algorithm that can always just run in a known amount of time or a known-ish amount of time and tell us yes or no with, with certainty. But in general, that's not possible in, in to do that for any proof. Basically, we'd have to, in order to have an arbitrarily powerful logical system and then have an algorithm that could just figure it all out for us, we would have created an algorithm that could find a proof of any, of any proposition in the universe. That's impossible. It, can't, it literally cannot be done. So, that's the problem with Rust, and it's, it's a very reasonable thing for it to do, is that you know, the bar checker cannot reason about the correctness of unsafe code, at least not all the time. But Rust needs unsafe to actually be realistic, right? The, this decidable subset of this, this, this separation logic isn't powerful enough to write and verify automatically all the programs that we need to write. It just isn't, isn't powerful enough. So this is where something called the iris separation logic comes in. And this is where the, the story starts to get both exciting and really frustrating. Because iris, the iris separation logic was made by a team of academics. And basically, the purpose of this particular complicated, you know, very intricate separation logic is that it is built and it is powerful enough to verify arbitrarily complex Rust programs, even ones that include unsafe. So it's written in Coke, right? They use this system, this language I was talking about earlier. And it's possible for them to verify arbitrarily complex Rust programs because they write proofs. They use tactics and stuff to help them and to find proofs in some situations or whatever. But they actually have to write proofs for a lot of these more complicated situations. They can't just 
unleash some algorithm. Again, that, that's impossible to, to write such an algorithm. They could always, always figure out these things. And so here are some good papers. <coughs> They're good. They're, they would be very difficult to jump into right away. Um, these are pretty punishing. Um, you, you can get through them. They've actually written a lot better than most academic papers, but still. Um, and yeah, this, this work is amazing that they did because essentially using IRIS, they were able to verify the, the safety and the consistency of the Rust type system and its ownership and lifetime system and its send and sync, you know, kind of those core ideas of Rust that make it what it is. They're able to verify that all of that makes sense, the, the system, at least a model of it. They were even able to verify a bunch of libraries that use unsafe internally because they have to. They would be impossible without it. Things like, you know, ARC and Mutex. And then there's even follow-on work, something called the Iron Resource Obligation Management Logic that was used IRIS. And it's powerful enough to verify that a program has no resource leaks. You know, for example, that it, if it allocates memory, it always collects all the memory that it, that it allocates, so it doesn't leak memory. Or you could use it for things like file handles or any kind of resource obligation like this. So wow, I mean, that's really amazing. This is something that is, is as powerful as we really could ever want it to be. And probably there could be small changes on the margins to make it more easy to use or more powerful in some situations. But I mean, that can do basically everything we want it to do, right? Something cannot get much more complicated than mutex or, or memswap. Those are kind of some of the lowest level bits of software we could possibly write. Again, follow on question. Why isn't everyone doing this? Why isn't this common? What's going on? Um, part of it is, again, research debt. I mean, IRIS was, was built in something like, or those, those papers came out in something like 2018. You know, it's ongoing work that the academics are still doing stuff with it. But, <coughs> you know, no one else really knows even that this exists. And part of it is that those papers, again, they're for the researchers and their peers. They are, they use Greek letters liberally. They have really, uh, really, random, obtuse, opaque kind of symbols and notation that they come up with that you can't search for what they mean and they don't tell you how to pronounce them, which makes it really hard to read through. And there's ideas that you have to chase down all the papers yourself to figure out what they're talking about and put together the web of knowledge yourself. So that's part of it. The real problem <coughs> is that Iris is not a directly usable language. It's written in Coke, like I said, but it's like a Coke library. It's not actually something that can com compile programs or reason about programs, and it's not built into any other tools that can do that. It's only really built, this Coke library, it's built for on-the-side proofs, meaning that rather than verifying actual source code, right, maybe for example the Rust source code that it's, it's reasoning about, it verifies kind of this translated model of it in this kind of Coke notation that the researchers came up with to represent all these ideas. So here, for example, is the option as mute or option as mutable function that you know, takes in an option type and, and can give you the, the insights of it mutably if it happens to be some. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So this works. I mean, they probably did, a, I, I'm assuming that the researchers have audited this really well. And, and they did actually catch problems in the Rust code base as they were verifying some of these implementations. They said, oh, this, this doesn't make sense. And we, we found a proof doing it this way. And we, we can demonstrate that it's not safe when you're doing it the way that the Rust library does it, the Rust standard library. So this was obviously very useful. But, you know, it's, it's out of sync. It's not built to build something. It's only really built to write papers. And a lot of papers are being created. But more or less, all of this amazing work is kind of collecting dust. It's sitting in the ivory tower. No one else knows that it exists. So I think that's a shame. <laughs> and that is kind of the motivation behind Magmine. All these ideas of form of verification shouldn't be just only being used for writing papers. They need to be helping us build secure, runnable systems. And that's the goal of Magmind, is to get all of this into many more hands. And in order to achieve this goal of making this, these ideas widespread and making them capable for many more people to use them to actually build running systems, these are the, the kind of principles that I think the project has to abide by for it to really work. <laughs> Let's go through one. So I'll try to go through these pretty quickly. So the first is that, you know, Rust gives us a decidable subset, this little closed thing. 
And usually that's what people build for engineers, is they say, oh, if you can cram your problem into this little, little box, then you don't have to do any hard proving. You don't, have to f you don't have to really rigorously prove that what you're doing is correct. Just get it in here, and then you're good. We did all the work. And I think that's lame. <laughs> so, you know, basically, rather than giving people a little closed subset, we should give them the full thing, right? The full type theory, which is what Coke is based on. And basically, we should make it so any team, you know, teams using a tool like this can formalize any assertion they have, right? They can, they can make claims about anything they want. They don't always have to, but they can. And that's the thing is these kind of decidable subsets are still possible. If you go all the way to a full type theory, a full powerful logic, you can still give yourself, you can, we can still create these, these closed systems where you know, everything can be easy here, but then we retain the ability to drop out of that, you know, to do more powerful things that still relate to that decidable subset. Same thing with performance, is that computation is assembly language at the end of the day. And so in order to make sure this can be used to verify any software, and especially the software that most importantly needs to be correct, which is the lowest level stuff, we need to go down to assembly language. So we should go all the way down to the lowest level, start there. We should use Iris, right? It's, it's incredible power. Um, same thing here. If we go all the way down, we can build abstractions on top of that that are less performant when, for when situations when we don't have to think in assembly language. And you know, indeed, we shouldn't. Assembly language is really difficult to write. But essentially, the way it's going to do this is being like LLVM. Coke, or not Coke, excuse me, Magmide, wants to step into the same position that LLVM is in. Um, so it'll basically be an abstract assembly language. And this design means that since we have a, a proof language right alongside this abstract assembly language, we can have every particular architecture, like, like LLVM, Every particular backend, you know, every every architecture, things like ARM and MIPS and, and Intel, all of those we can directly model those. We can have what are, I'm calling hardware axioms, where we define the actual literal instruction set in our logical system, and then make sure that when we translate from our abstract assembly language down, we're doing it correctly. So we can have end-to-end -end verified software all the way down to the bare metal, down to the level that we can't go any further, because you know, at that point we have to say, well, the hardware, we hope that it does all these things. That's where we have to remain humble. And then we rely on these, these assumptions of, of the behavior of hardware. <coughs> the next thing is that the language has got to be gradually verifiable. It has to be practical, and it has to not require people to verify everything all the time and all up front. So basically to achieve this idea, I think this is probably the, the, the most important unique idea that is going to go into Magmind. This is the idea of trackable effects. And it's going to use the iron system, the resource management obligation logic we talked about earlier that was built with Iris, basically to track <coughs> um, safety and correctness conditions, but to do so in a way that gives us complete knowledge of program safety that is absolute but flexible. So as an example, what this means is in Rust, you can have you know, un unsafe code that is actually unsafe, that isn't doing something correctly, and then you can wrap that unsafeness in safe code and make it look like this, this code is safe and can be used by other people. And basically the idea of trackable effects is that using you know, basically tokens or whatever, we can go along and at certain points of our program if we do something that is possibly dangerous, maybe that violates memory safety or that could make the program run forever or that is not executed, you know, could, could execute foreign code. If we do something that could be dangerous and we don't justify the safety of that operation with a proof that no, in fact, this is safe, then basically our function gets infected with this trackable effect saying, oh, this function is not proven to be memory safe. It, I mean, it could still possibly be, but it's not proven to be, it's not known to be. So this is cool because if we have something like this, you can still write, um, you can still write a function that's not correct that you maybe aren't even sure does the right thing yet, as you're incrementing your as you're as you're iterating towards something. And you can still reuse that function, right? Where, where the way we're that I'm trying to design this trackable effect system is that we want you to be able to still run or compile and run this function even though it's not proven to be safe. But we still want other people, you know, both you reusing this function and other people if they try to use this function, to know that that problem is there, to know that this is not safe. 
regardless of how many layers down this thing is in. So basically, yeah, we're giving complete program safety knowledge, but we're flexibly allowing people to not know what they're doing yet. So this is going to be practical both to slowly replace old code bases, right, rather than having to rewrite a whole code base in one big chunk and verify that it's all correct, you can do parts of it. And this is kind of like Rust, right? This, this can be used, for example, to Magmite can be used to implement the Rust compiler um, if, if that's something that people want to do. And we could have it so that you could write unsafe code, but then prove that it's safe. And then this effect would go away. And if you were using code that had uns real lack of safety deep inside of it, you'd still know, right? So yeah, the whole idea is that rather than requiring everything to be perfect and all verified up front, we can converge towards correctness. That's realistic. We have to do that. And frankly, yeah, to make it so people can slowly figure out a problem rather than having to know everything all at once, that's probably what we want to do um, in the end anyway. <coughs> then another really important thing is that all of these, this work, this proof labor, and the foundations that are being created with Magmite are fully reusable. So this is related to this idea of the verification pyramid that I've been talking about. So basically, you know, the verification pyramid is we have really important infrastructural foundational software at the bottom, and it has to be correct. Things like operating systems and, and firmware and kernel drivers and, you know, networking drivers, all these kinds of things. That really has to be correct, and the people who write that have to be much more rigorous, and they have to write proofs, and they have to make sure that all of this makes sense. But then we want them, their labor, to be able to be passed on to people at higher levels and all the way kind of up of higher levels don't have to worry as much about things or maybe it's not as important that what they're doing is, is correct you know a recipe app isn't it doesn't have to be rigorously verified as correct but it'd be nice if it was sitting on foundations that made it so it was at least secure so that's the idea is that we want this kind of reusability and basically the way that Magmite intends to do that is by having deep metaprogramming as part of the, the way the language works and having a query-based compiler so that all the parts of the compiler are, are easier to reuse in other contexts. So, you know, this could be done both things like operating systems. You know, an operating system could pass on abstractions to higher levels to have a, a provably secure set of abstractions for a safe user land. Or we could build higher level languages in Magmite. So Rust could be an example of one that could get this treatment, but we could do it for lots of other things. You know, in those higher level languages, it'd be really cool if we could take the power of the full power of Magmite and kind of lift it and make it available to this higher level language, but not mandatory. So someone can go along, you know, you can write safe Rust, and you could just do that and not worry about writing proofs. But then if you need it, it'd be nice to have escape hatches to drop down into the full power of Magmite and do stuff with it, right? To prove that what you're doing is safe for, to prove higher level ideas. So yeah, we don't have to write proofs for everything. And so we should make it possible to reuse as much of this labor as we can. <coughs> then, you know, I'll breeze through these ones. You know, Ru yeah, Rust and Carco have proven we can have nice things. So we should make these things usable. We should build tooling that removes as much incidental, you know, pointless, uh, distracting complexities as possible and allows us to focus on the real meat of our problems, the essential complexity. And very, very importantly, we need things that are taught effectively, right? That are not, not only papers for academic merit that are intended for other cutting edge researchers who have the time, I guess that's something I, I kind of breezed through earlier, but engineers have resource constraints. They need to actually build things they have deadlines, and they don't have all the time in the world because they, their, their goal was building something and shipping something. An academic's full job is being an academic, reading papers, writing papers, d ingesting the literature, teaching classes about the, the research they do. And so kind of we've baked into the structure, the job of academia, that they have time for all this research debt, which is assume everything takes a long time and everything takes a long time to learn, or we, we only allow people who are able to ingest this really fast for some reason to be successful. And so this research debt just kind of keeps accumulating and we keep giving the people who are creating the problem time to continue dealing with the problem. So that's not the case for engineers. Okay? The engineers do not have time to wade through this, this literature and pull together all the different sources and, 
and, and fight with punishingly poorly designed tools. And this is all important because this research needs to be applied. It, it is a, a, a shameful waste of human potential that so much of these incredible ideas are sitting around and not actually being used to benefit society. So yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a basic idea of respecting people's time, respecting users' time. If you can explain something well, you should. And at least at some level, someone's job should be to explain things properly. So, you know, here's a bunch of the kind of concepts that Magmite intends to use to explain things properly. You know, assume someone's trying to get something done. They're not interested in kind of just vaguely understanding things. They're trying to achieve something, so they need to understand it. We should put concrete examples before formal definitions. We should tell people when there's real prerequisites. You know, if we, if we don't have time to, to explain what something is in a lot of depth, we should say, hey, go over there and learn about it, and then you can talk about this, rather than just assuming that someone knows what we're talking about. And then we should use, you know, graspable words that have meaning in our minds, rather than random symbols, especially non-ASCII symbols, that are hard to even say, I don't even know how to figure out what this thing is. So, yeah, and then the syntax of a language should make it really easy to, to see a piece of, of, of behavior or see a piece of code and understand how to trace that piece of code to its definition so you can understand it. So yeah, the, the design of Magmite. Here's kind of a, another high level idea of it. Basically, in order to achieve these, all these, these necessary requirements that I was talking about is the design. You know, how do we design something that is amenable to all of those ideas? <coughs> And this is the core thing that I think is going to make Magmite quite powerful, is that the pure logical system and the more bare metal computational system are separate from one another. We basically have you know, these kind of languages that have a, a, a dualistic relationship with one another. They, they go in this, this kind of cycle. So logic Magmite is the pure functional thing, a lot like Coke, but we can have the opportunity to design it more, more approachably. And it is used at compile time. It's imaginary, and it just reasons at compile time about real code, host Magmite. Magmite that can run on your computer. It's like LLVM. And that is used basically to self-host, or you know, it, it is used to implement itself eventually. <laughs> it, we're in, I'm in the process of bootstrapping this thing, but it will implement the logic Magmite proof checker and parsers and everything. And then it will implement itself. So that basically at the lowest level, we have bare metal software, right? Things running the lowest level of abstraction, or not, not even the, this is the lowest level of abstraction, just the highest amount of performance we can possibly get without any barriers like garbage collectors or, or interpreter environments or whatever. And we have that at the, that the very, very bottom. So this thing is going to run as fast as it possibly could. It has the maximum amount of logical power it possibly could. And it's also extremely reusable because it's like LLVM. So I guess, yeah, this is the real goal of the project. <coughs> Or, it, you know, it's a good way of stating the goal of the project is in the same way that we're trying to replace C over time with Rust because Rust is more powerful, it can reason about more things, and it's easier to use, it's more approachable. Magmine wants to do the same thing for Coke and LLVM, right? Again, Coke is basically logic Magmine, LLVM is basically host Magmine. And so we want those two things close, you know, right next to each other at the lowest levels that are then capable of forming a foundation for everything else. So yeah, Magmite wants to be to Coke and LLVM what Rust has been to see. And yeah, I mean, I'm in the process of bootstrapping this. Um, right now, all I basically have is some, you know, exploratory proofs and a Coke plugin and kind of some, you know, a lot of this design thinking. I've been, burn I've been burned very bad by just charging after ideas in the past rather than getting enough people to to, to get around and say that both is, is reasonable and point out problems and to maybe, you know, help rather than just charging it all after myself. So <clears throat> that's the plan. The bootstrapping plan is to use Coke for initial proofs uh, to kind of make all this make sense at first and LLVM for compilation. So uh, I, th I, f I feel like maybe six months of full-time effort could get me to the point, something like that, where we had uh, a usable, interesting prototype of this where you could write kind of maybe not fully powered but simple magmite programs you can ingest them into coke and then you can write proofs about them in coke so that's that's a problem right it's kind of a gap but for practicality that's part of the bootstrapping plan 
but then you can, you know, after you've proved things about these Magmai programs, you can compile them to LLVM. And you can have an LLVM object that you can link with other things. So that's the idea is that slowly we can start to build um, all of these pieces, this self-hosting infrastructure that is written in itself and is all verified. But little by little, by reusing the power of LLVM to kind of bootstrap us. Yeah, and I guess last slide, um, or almost last slide, is just thinking, okay, what, what could widespread formal verification bring us, right? If this was successful, this is a massive, hugely ambitious project. It's incredibly huge. I certainly cannot do it all myself. It will take hundreds or thousands of, of extremely dedicated contributors over, over many years to build something like this. But if, it's, if, if it is successful, if we're able to achieve this and have a language that is approachable, that has all of this power that people can use for all these different applications, <coughs> how might that change society? How might that make things better? So an important idea that is really, really exciting is the idea of proof carrying code. Meaning that in, in our existing things like executables, right, binary executables, we have the actual program, but typically executables have kind of a text or data section that carries things, I don't mean, sometimes it carries things like debug symbols or, or other just kind of metadata about this executable. <coughs> and the essential idea of proof carrying code is that part of what we can put alongside our assembly language programs, our raw assembly language, is proof symbols or you know, proof information about the program we have here. Meaning that we could take something like the Magma compiler and we can look just at a piece of code, not have any idea where it came from, not have any idea who wrote it, and be able to still statically verify that this piece of code is safe, that it is well behaved in all these ways, that it is memory safe, that it won't try to execute you know, where it's not supposed to, it's not gonna do all these things that we don't want it to do. So I mean, this, this piece of code you know, could come from North Korea and it would still be safe to run with arbitrary capability. We could run it with arbitrary um, permissions in, in uh, whatever ring of the operating system we want. Maybe we still wouldn't choose to do that, but it is possible. And it is especially exciting to think about that being applied, again, in operating systems that are pulling package code from all over the, the internet, possibly, or browsers running code you know, in the browser. It would be really great to be able to do this faster and more native and with less overhead. And that's possible with this idea of proof carrying code. Yeah, and of course, you know, we can just get a lot of stuff that can be provably correct and secure. Operating systems, firmware, network drivers, browsers, things like voting software, things that we're not, we're not willing to do now because we know how software, how unreliable software is. Maybe there's some things that could add a lot of benefit to society that we'd actually be confident we could do correctly and that would be safe to do. Things like voting, things that are really high risk. Maybe this is maybe probably many years in the future, but again, this idea of these techniques being in many more hands, being much more widespread, becomes possible. So, I mean, trackable effects means we can have package ecosystems where, you know, people can't just publish malicious code and then have it get into everyone else's, everyone else's um, systems. We can just know these things and we can reject them at the type system level. We can say, no, my code, I have in all the flags switched on that it has to be memory safe and I'm, I'm not willing to tolerate that. So you can't sneak that in on me. Um, things like more advanced borrow checking algorithms, right? Maybe other versions of Rust, things that go further than Rust does, that have a more intricate borrow checking algorithm, that we can still be a decidable subset. We don't have to write proofs in those situations. That's always great. We'd love to have more automation, easier things. And an unappreciated one, I think, is part of the reason that programming itself is so powerful and the reason it has taken off so much in society is that when you're interacting with a compiler or a computer even, or, or an interpreter for a language, you kind of have an automated coach. You have this system that you can do things and get quick, immediate feedback about what you're doing, if it's correct or not. And a proof checker, uh, something like Coke or, or like what Magmite could be, is that, but for a much more powerful set of ideas. You know, rather than a math class having to do or, you know, maybe you're taking a math class where you're writing all your proofs and you kind of have to say, uh, is this right? And you hand it into your professor and they tell you a week later that it's wrong. Instead, we can have, no, I can figure out if this is right right now. I can iterate. I have a coach that's teaching me the rules of logic, teaching me how to build proofs, teaching me what things are correct or not. I think that we'll probably have a surprising p impact on society in general. 
I, I'm not sure. I can't figure all this out, but I think that would be a big deal. So yeah, okay, thank you. This is achievable. <laughs> this is a goal that I think is extremely important. And again, I cannot do it by myself. That's the reason I'm giving this talk. Um, the, the ideas like this need lots of contribution. They need support, they need help, and they need people pointing out the things that maybe we're not missing, or that maybe we are missing at this point. So if you have feedback, if you know something about these fields, if you have something to offer, please, please reach out to me. And here is the, the repo where this project is ongoing. And yeah, thank you. I hope to see you. I hope to work with you. I hope for us to work together to make software and therefore the world better. Thank you.